Hello, everyone. Thank you for, for having us here today. The presentation that Hakan and I are going to present to you at this conference is SSI Interoperability in a large German showcase project on secure digital identity. I will introduce all of that shortly, but maybe a few words on why we are presenting together. So my name is Kai Wagner. I'm presenting for the Germany based company Yolocom. We are a pioneer in self-sovereign identity technology. We have been working on this topic for over seven years now and are developing different infrastructure layer technologies for SSI. And my colleague Hakan Yildiz is working at the TU Berlin, a local university here in Berlin, and is working in the same framework project of the German government. But as you will see shortly, there is a total of four consortia working in SSI oriented pilots in order to introduce this technology to the German market and pilot it there. And those four projects are made out of made up from different organizations and companies. And Hakan and me are representing different companies from these consortia. And since we're talking about interoperability, we're presenting to you together as interoperability is about cooperation. And that's why we also present this as a cooperation. Um, so much being said as a bit of a pre info on why we are presenting as two people here. I want to give you a quick intro into the agenda. So what we're trying to do in our call or in our in our presentation is to give you an introduction to these German showcase projects to work a bit on the definition of interoperability that we have defined in our showcase projects to be the one we want to work with and that we also think is sensible for the task. Then Hakan is going to jump in and going to, is going to talk about how SSI interoperability can actually be approached and how we systemically went about this task. And finally, we will talk about interoperability is actually aimed for in the projects in practice. So we will really get hands on into how we manage protocol selection and how we actually try to develop towards a coherent stack that allows for interoperability. Moving into this first topic. We will now look at the showcase projects for secure digital identities. And a first note on this is that there is, as I said, four of them called ONCE, ID Ideal, SDK, and ID Union. Those names are going to come back, so no worries and no need to recommend uh, to remind them at the moment. A bit of background on these projects is that they are projects funded by the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs. So they're funded and set kind of directly at the highest level of the state in terms of the political will and power connected to it. And they're implemented in order to overcome a range of issues that has become apparent in the digital identity market in Germany, but also in Europe over the last few years. Number one of the problems that was identified as a kind of issue to be solved by these projects is that Germany has introduced a secure EID solution um, over 10 years ago. But unfortunately, none of this solution or its kind of preceding um, kind of access tools has really managed to allow for widespread adoption. So no widespread adoption of this secure EID solution appeared which is of high frustration for the German government because this is their official EID solution. And a second point, which is really important, is that the secure identity solutions that are in the market, and I think we all know this all too well, are often isolated and only work within separate ecosystems. So you either have a government identity system or you have an industry identity system. You might have some that works in your finance sector quite well, but usually it even works only for your one bank, one platform, one service. And a third point that the ministry was frustrated about and tries to overcome with this research and, and pilot project is that users want to handle their identity related tasks with a minimum of effort and ideally just one solution available on a smartphone. And SSI is just perfectly placed to do that, um, which I will come to in a second. Also, a big issue to the ministry, as I already said, the project is funded by the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs, 
is that German and also European solutions play little to no role in the end user identity market at large. So there is also an interest in making sure that providers of these technologies and services utilizing these technologies can actually play a role in the global market for digital identity. And in the current platform based economy around identity, this is very hard to achieve because of the monopoly players we have in place. Continuing a bit on this kind of history of the project, and I think it's important to understand why we are spending so much time on achieving interoperability in them, is that there was first a phase of competition where different tenders were basically provided by different consortia. And over half a year, there was 11 consortia presenting concepts and really working on concepts to achieve the goals I've just been mentioning before. And in December 2020, so already over a year ago, there were four consortia selected for implementation. And the big surprise at that time was that all of these consortia were utilizing SSI technology. In the original 11 consortia, there was only, I think, five out of 11 consortia utilizing SSI technology. And when we realized that four consortia were selected and all of them utilized SSI technology, it became very apparent that the federal ministry is in support of this new concept, which obviously is of high importance for us as projects because we know we have the financial and the political backing for our work. Since April last year, we have finally seen the start of these projects and the implementation phase of these projects, which is going to last until about March 2024. So we have quite a long project time duration. And also interesting to know for you might be that each consortium is receiving 15 million euros of funding, which is backed by an additional um, individual input by each consortium partner amounting to around 25 to 30 millions per consortium. And as you can count on, um, about 100 to 120 million money spent overall into these pilots million euros so quite a significant investment by the state but also by the private sector entities involved in these projects and we think that this will have a significant effect on the global ssi landscape as well a bit of a note on how these projects are structured so they're actually all trying to achieve the kind of rollout of ssi technology and eid in a different region of Germany. So they're all having a regional focus. As you can see, some of them span across a bit of a wider regional context, while others are more located in distinct locations around big cities and larger metropolis. Um, but this is really something that is also quite specific about these projects because they are allowing for a very interesting ecosystem setup to be tested. And for those users within a particular testing region, they provide multiple areas of use and multiple utilities at once, thus providing a user experience that is not just limited to one use case, as it often is with pilots, but actually providing a full ecosystem to users and coming kind of a lot closer to the reality of an SSI use um, in the future. Use cases that are actually worked on these projects are ranging from e-government over mobility, health, commerce, industry 4.0, energy, education, tourism, and a lot more. And yeah, we're happy to speak about this later in the question and answer session. If there's any questions on the projects, we're also always happy to provide additional information on um, email or via email or also in the chat of this conference. But now I will just Ah, sorry, we'll just have to, ooh, that was unintended. Um, I will have to give you a, a kind of a bit of an outlook of why we are here, um, because it's not so interesting to look at a German pilot project from the outset, unless you're involved in it, or you're just looking at it after it has been finished. So what's the reason for you to listen today? And I think the reason that makes this project interesting also for the wider SSI community is that it's putting real pressure and real need on the question of interoperability and convergence of technologies. Usually this is more of a voluntary endeavor where different players in the SSI ecosystem are doing this voluntarily. And this, as you often know, voluntarily gives you a bit of attention to the topic, but usually as soon as people are distracted by something more up on the agenda um, or priority list, the voluntary efforts seem to not be followed as much. 
And here in this project, since it's not a voluntary task to achieve interoperability, but it's actually mandated by the project, um, and since there's sufficient financial backing, we have quite a different dynamic when it comes to trying to achieve interoperability and working towards it. And Hakan and I, as well as a few colleagues of ours, have been working on this topic since early last year. And for the case of Yolocom, we've been working on interoperability related projects for the last four years. And I think Hakan has been involved in the DIFF working group around this for at least two years as well. So we've all been coming from other interoperability projects and kind of trying to apply our learning just here in the project. The big challenges we have in order to achieve interoperability is obviously that four different projects in four different regions, as you can see on the map, is quite hard to achieve because they're not all coming in with the same, same tech concept. They're not coming all in with the same stack, right? They're not all using the same agent. They're not using the same protocols, um, at least not yet. And at the same time, there is a huge need to make sure that things are staying compatible with DWeb and Web3 technologies so that we're not kind of moving all the way too much into a specialized German interoperability solution, but that we're actually keeping our eyes open to the wider, um, to the wider ecosystem. And lastly, the global market doesn't stop just because we have a German project, right? So we have to be sure that we are actually following up on market developments and market dynamics and that we're making sure the interop efforts we do here can actually be aligned with the global interop efforts. And things that we heard from Drummond before about things happening at Trust over IP, and a lot of stuff happening at the W3C, important work, in my opinion, happening in the DIF interoperability working group, because that spans really a large group um, of very different actors that come together at this place. But yeah, so much a bit for the challenges and why we're actually having um, such an interesting project here. Second thing I wanted to introduce to you today is the definition of interoperability that we work by and that we think is making a lot of sense when you try to systemically approach the topic. And just to give you a bit of a kind of um, first hand on it. So according to Paul Frey et al, they define interoperability as the ability to exchange data and other information between systems, applications or components. So while this is not yet very clear, potentially, um, it's, it's actually apparent that interoperability is something that can be used easily and that can often be misunderstood because there is no single one definition for inter interoperability. Actually, people use it having quite different things in mind and it can mean very different things for different verticals and systems. So it's important to actually specify it a bit more. And an example given here is that in healthcare or IoT, interoperability might require very different things and might mean very different things. So what's important to look into is the kind of systemic perspective on interoperability and how you can potentially differentiate interoperability into different levels that have to be achieved in order to achieve kind of a higher level um, result, which then can be called interoperability. And we will go into that in a second. So the levels of interoperability that we have defined for our work and that actually um, are also represented in this graphic here is technical interoperability at the core. So this is the ability to exchange information between SSI actors, so effectively between different agents, end user wallets, issuer agents, etc. Then as a kind of next layer to the onion that we see here, um, there is the syntactical interoperability. So this is about structurally understanding the exchanged information. So really becoming clear about how do you understand, how does the technical system understand the information that is passed between agents. Then next on, we have semantic interoperability. This is also of core importance because it's the ability to have a common understanding of the exchanged information. So this is really about what's in the credential. How is it structured there? How is it actually um, according to some clear schema, etc. And the last thing, and this is something that I think Drummond's call was very much about, is the organizational interoperability as well. So accepting and exchanging information between different organizations requires them to agree on the terms. 
And that is something that is oftentimes overlooked and that cannot happen in the beginning, but that really has to happen after the other onion layers have been fully defined. So everybody knows what they're getting into with their business. And in our projects, we're trying to achieve all of these. And currently we have started to very hardly or kind of very clearly address the technical interoperability, which Hakan will also, I think, spend most of the time on. But we've also started to work on syntactic, semantic, and organizational interoperability and hope to really get very far on this during our projects until 2024. A way to achieve interoperability is now where it really gets interesting because there is actually three ways of doing this. And one of them is that we can use the same software, right? If we all just use Microsoft Word, everybody is going to have a great experience checking um, the grammar check, checking the spell check, making sure that no things are jumping around on pages. But unfortunately, not the whole world can afford or wants to use Microsoft Word or whatever SSI stack um, for this case. And that's why same software might not be the only solution, right? The other thing we can do is that we can build based on common specification protocols and standards. And that is something we will definitely look a bit more into. Um, and kind of as a last solution or last way to go, you can just build middleware, right? So you can go down the path of building some customized middleware that is able to translate from one system to another. An approach that is often used, has been often used in the past, but usually has issues with scaling and oftentimes also doesn't economically work out in the long run. So where should we go? And what we thought makes sense for SSI ultimately is to kind of match the overarching goals of self-sovereign identity with the different interoperability approaches and see which one is most fitting. And the overarching goals that we have kind of highlighted here is developing an open infrastructure. That's ultimately the goal of SSI in our opinion. So it's about having a global open infrastructure for decentralized identity. Then it's about avoiding lock-in scenarios for users. So we want to make sure users have a choice in the beginning and they maintain that choice over time, right? So it's about actually making users empowered to make their own decisions and also to change providers over time. And finally, there is the question of privacy by design. So how do we avoid routing data through places where it just shouldn't be, right? How do we make sure things always happen as direct as possible between the actors required for the interaction? Something that at least in our opinion is also core or at the core of SSI technology. And this ultimately boils down to trying to reach interoperability or aiming to reach interoperability by common standards, protocols, and specifications. And that's what we're trying to do. So needing to take this into account, um, we have three years for the projects. As said, the first year is almost over. So two years are coming to finish this big project. We need to coordinate across multiple diverse consortia, and you will see in a second from Hakan how that actually looks. And ultimately, we need to take into account a lot of the existing solutions and networks in order to make sure that the common protocols, specifications, and standards that we build on are actually matching up with the real world outside of our projects. And having that said, I hand over to Hakan, and he's also going to take over the slide deck. So I'm just stopping my sharing screen now. Thank you. Thank you, Kai. <clears throat> um, I think this was like more or less a seamless transition. I hope you're seeing my um, yeah screen now. In that case, I would like to continue. So uh, we were talking about uh, yeah uh, levels of interoperability, which is about um, understanding what we want to reach, uh, organization level interoperability. However, the question of like how we are going to reach it is still an open uh, question out there, and the reason is because um, SSI is a yeah complex technology or a set of um, technologies that build up to uh, coming from different uh, various systems or um, technologies such as information security or communications and cryptography. And this is why we, have, we need a more thorough understanding of um, what needs to be interoperable. And to do that, uh, we did, oh, just a second, yeah. 
we did work uh, uh, together with the Decentralized Identity Foundation on a reference model of SSI, uh, which uh, similar to uh, uh, Trust over OIP and Drummond's uh, presentation exists of four layers. And um, uh, in these four layers, there are different components and considerations that makes up an SSI technology stack and an SSI ecosystem in the end of the day. So uh, in the lowest layer, we do have trust layer, which covers um, yeah, all the components and considerations uh, related to creating trust between different SSI actors. The, uh, the second layer is about uh, uh, the communication of uh, agents which are uh, running softwares within the domain of uh, SSI actors, such as issuers, holders, and verifiers, so that they can communicate with each other in a secure uh, uh, and trustful manner. And in the third layer, uh, comes up the credential part. So since we can, we have trust, build trust now, and we can exchange information. Now we can also exchange credentials, may it be verifiable credentials and presentations. And credential layer covers everything related to that. And on top of it, we do have also the application layer, which is uh, the uh, coverage of uh, the business logic of uh, what kind of an application this is supposed to be. May it be, a, for example, an issuer agent, which is uh, also all purposes to uh, issue verifiable cred credentials, but also it might be related to a more use case specific area, such as uh, creating organizational ID IDs, which are all mapped to the, uh, to the application layer. And um, additionally, we do have cross-layer considerations and components, which uh, has basically more than one uh, dependency in one of these trust layers. For example, uh, yeah, cryptography or crypto primitives uh, is important for agent-to-agent -agent communications, but also issues of credentials. And those are covered in the cross-layer considerations and components. Okay, so uh, maybe in the audience, you might be wondering at this point, uh, what seems to be the difference between the trust over IP model and uh, the uh, Decentralized Identity Foundation reference model. I would say they're very, very similar. However, um, I would say that the trust over IP model is, uh, has more emphasis on the governance part of the things, whereas in the um, reference model of uh, the Sanchez Identity Foundation, we're trying to look into more of a technical point of view to understand what components there are within a given layer to understand the differences and uh, incompatibility issues, so to speak. And with that, I would like to jump up to the uh, next slide, which is uh, where we can start covering uh, the individual components. And the layer one we saw mentioned uh, is the trust layer. Uh, which covers the fundamental components of SSI identifiers and namespaces, blockchain and DLT infrastructure. And we do have here uh, seven different components. Um, yeah, one of them was the first and foremost is of course the DIT document. And the DIT documents are uh, mostly standardized in the W3C working group. Uh, and there is also uh, one is little deviation in the SF version of the DIT documents. However, they are very, very similar. And uh, how we get these DIT documents are with the resolution of a DIT uh, via, may it be through the universal resolver, which Marcus probably uh, Zapatello talked about today, uh, but also uh, within there, there are different uh, considerations such as DIT resolution, DIT dereferencing, but also the work of peer DITs or pairwise DITs. Uh, and these uh, are a result of uh, did methods. So the did methods instructs how a did resolves into a did document. And there are, uh, yeah, various uh, did methods. I think the number is around 110, 110, 115. Um, yeah, so that would be the part that is uh, a component that we consider. And based on whether it is like a pair did, pairwise did or a uh, public did, such as the one that is registered in a sovereign network, uh, there are different did document histories, such as revocable null dits uh, or current only state dits, such as we see in the pairwise dits, or curable historic states where every, each and every state of the did can be uh, curated in a distributed ledger, for example. And uh, all these did methods are anchored on a uh, yeah, uh, distributed ledger, for example, such as a sovereign network or a hyperledger Indian network, but also in non-DLT consensus ledgers such as uh, used in carry. Um, 
yeah, maybe two more uh, points to mention here is the DIT scaling, which is uh, a uh, yeah, additional solution to be able to uh, generate or do uh, read, create, update, and uh, revoke options on DITs on a more um, massive scale is uh, the use of uh, SiteG protocol, for instance, to be able to um, utilize a public uh, permissionless network such as Bitcoin or uh, Ethereum network, which are uh, heavy or uh, more expensive to write on a, a ledger. Um, there are layer two solutions for it. And one of them is, for example, SiteG protocol. And uh, another, which is worth mentioning, is the carry, which can be uh, attached to any uh, distributed ledger. Okay, so how does this all uh, uh, compose within each other? I would like to show in this next uh, composition uh, with the uh, dits being in the center, uh, the composition of the trust layer. So in the middle, we do have uh, yeah, decentralized identifier. A dit provider can provide many dits uh, and each dit as a subject has one dit document. And dit document is a required component as well as um, yeah, the resolution and the method of the DIT documents. The resolution might happen through uh, uh, instance such as Universal Resolver, uh, but uh, also through uh, their own uh, yeah, DIT, DIT method, uh, which is also then covered in uh, either in a DIT, uh, anchor such as Hyperledger Indie Network or, or a, a public permissionless network such as Bitcoin, but also a, a non-DLT solution such as Carry. Uh, and optionally, a decentralized identifier or in trust layer, we can have two more components, one of them being the scaling solution, may it be site to your carry, or also did anchor services, which are services that can be used, uh, utilized by the use of uh, decentralized identifiers, such as uh, encrypted data vaults. With that, I would like to move to the next layer, which is uh, agent layer. and uh, to make a terminology here, and in SSI, an agent is a software uh, that is in the domain of an actor, SSI actor, like I mentioned before, as an issuer, uh, identity holder, or verifier, that can communicate with other agents and also with the trust anger, such as DLT. And in order to do these activities, an agent uh, has to have a certain set of components that are necessary. First and foremost is probably the envelope. Uh, which is necessary to uh, have information security properties such as authenticity, integrity, confidentiality um, for sending messages between a sender and a receiver in a secure manner. Um, and here there are uh, different uh, yeah, standards that can be used, uh, one of them being uh, DITCOM v1, which is more in the uh, domain of uh, area which is used in Hyperledger Indie, but also DITCOM v2, which is more of a uh, yeah, more open standard that is being embraced by many other um, yeah, solution providers, so to speak. But it can also be uh, outside the world of DITs and um, the new, uh, more, more or less the new uh, Hyperledger Aries uh, world, which is a self-issued OpenID Connect provider did profile where um, the existing infrastructure of OpenID uh, Connect are uh, utilized for discovery purposes, for example, for the issues and verifiers. And since the envelope is a transport agnostic, we have to also consider certain transport methods such as HTTP, Bluetooth, or uh, yeah, QR codes, NFC, whatever. And these is uh, only possible through key operations, meaning, um, you know, oops, meaning if I want to sign and encrypt a message uh, and send it to a recipient, I need to do so while using public keys. And these key operations can be done within a uh, open wallet within the software, or it can be secured in certain uh, areas such as a, a hardware secure model or trusted execution environment, or in telematic, which is very, very popular in the e-health sector, uh, healthcare sector where uh, every card has these uh, chips inside. And also a very important part to uh, consider is the key control recovery in case the keys, the control of the keys are lost. So uh, here we cover the uh, backup options, uh, is especially uh, ones such as uh, decentralized key management solutions. And last but not least, uh, the data portability uh, that we 
I have to take into consideration for uh, the ability to um, import data, not only keys, but also verifiable credentials from one wallet to another. And the composition itself looks as uh, the following. So in the middle, we do have the sum an agent. And to create an understanding for what an agent is, is basically an agent can sign, encrypt, and forward messages for either the purpose of agent-to-agent -agent communication, but also for uh, uh, signing credentials, such as verifiable credentials, which we will cover in a, a minute. And uh, it can store optionally credentials, but it must also store uh, keys to uh, execute these operations that we mentioned here. An agent has also two separate, uh, it can have two locations. One of them is the cloud, and this is more suitable for agents uh, in the domain of an issuer or a verifier actor, or it can be in an edge environment, which is more suitable for uh, identity holder um, agents. Exactly. And we do have required components, as we mentioned, such as envelope. Uh, Noteworthy mentions that DITCOM v2 and SIOP uh, v2. Uh, but also transport that is necessary to move from one uh, yeah, recipient to the se from sender to the recipient. And it must also have control recovery and key operations uh, functionalities. And it can optionally have data portability for porting um, yeah, a wallet from one type of wallet to the other. And as the third layer, we do have the credential layer, which covers the identity related informations, uh, such as verifiable credentials and presentations, but a bit much more. So uh, here we have identified five different components and considerations. The first one being um, credential format. Uh, most known credential formats in SSI is, a, of course, a verifiable credentials and presentations. Um, and this credential format can have different type of proofs. Uh, at this point, for to be specific, a, a credential such as verifiable credentials can have um, yeah, JSON web token uh, or JSON web signatures in form of a JSON web token. Uh, it can have uh, JSON LD capabilities for creating semantic disambiguity, which is more important for the semantic uh, interoperability, uh, which comes with uh, JSON web signatures uh, uh, called LD proofs, or I think they're called now integrity uh, proofs. Or it can have uh, more privacy preserving uh, yeah, uh, properties by uh, using a credential proof called Anoncrest, which utilizes uh, CL signatures and comes with a, a set of privacy preserving pro properties that Drummond already mentioned in the previous talk. And it can also be finally, last but not least, a BBS plus uh, signature, which uses JSON LD credential type. Uh, which also comes with certain privacy preserving features and seems to be the future for uh, yeah, for the SSI community to move forward. And all of this, uh, of course, is also very important to mention credential revocation. There are revocations uh, uh, types that um, are suitable or used, for example, in the Anon creds, uh, but also which is highly privacy preserving. However, not so very scalable, or uh, there are some massive, uh, highly scalable, but not so very privacy preserving uh, revocation types, such as revocation uh, status list. Um, yeah, without maybe looking at a time. Uh, so there are also two more parts that are important to mention here. Maybe the credential exchange is very important because uh, credential itself uh, needs to be transferred from one place to another. For that, there are different credential exchange protocols and standards, such as present proof and issue protocol, uh, issue credentials from the uh, hyperledger areas, but also presentation exchange or credential manifest, which is uh, mentioned in the decentralized identity foundation or standardized. Okay, and uh, when we like take a look into the uh, composition part. Uh, again, at this point, we do have a uh, credential, SSI-based credential is in the uh, core of our um, composition. And a verifiable credential uh, can have many claims about a subject. And an anonymous credential, which is the anon creds, is a type of verifiable credential, which we will cover in a bit as well. And it has a total of four necessary components, being the credential uh, exchange that we uh, mentioned, credential format, uh, credential uh, proof uh, proof types, 
but also the credential binding, meaning how a verifiable credential is bound to the identity holder. And there are different methods here as well. Uh, as well as uh, there are optional components such as the credential revocation uh, and also delegation, which is a um, fairly recent topic. It's actually an old topic, but uh, starting to see a lot more interest is the uh, creating chain of trust uh, using uh, self-sovereign identities, meaning having a chain of uh, credentials to be able to uh, understand the uh, proof of authority or uh, where this authority coming from to issue credentials, basically. Uh, which is very uh, seen on the public key infrastructure with the X549 certificates and the root certificates towards the uh, with the certificate chain. And there are some works happening right now to make that happen also with the um, uh, self-sovereign identities. Oops. Okay, so uh, then we have the application layer uh, considerations such as uh, this is the highest layer first of all and it contains uh, uh, considerations regarding the use case areas uh, semantic data definitions the necessary ones for understanding credentials from use cases uh, coming from different ecosystems is also part of this and here most and foremost the um, important to consider as the semantic data definitions basically to create uh, understanding and meaning behind uh, yeah, the attributes within or claims given in the verifiable credentials uh, to have a uh, yeah ambi this ambiguous understanding, and for that there, can, there are different type of uh, yeah sources that can be used, such as schema.org that creates its own on to, comes with its own ontology and vocabulary, uh, but it can also be related to uh, a use case or vertical specific areas such as fire for healthcare or Europass learning model for uh, educational credentials. And finally, we do have the cross-layer considerations which covers the components and considerations which are related to more than one layer, such as uh, use of um, storage or data formats. But I will not go more into detail due to the time at this point, but it's important to know, um, yeah, maybe a couple of noteworthy ones are the attachments, which is used highly, especially using DITCOM uh, to send and receive uh, credentials, but also any other MIME type that can be uh, attached to a um, DITCOM message, basically. But also uh, the crypto primitives that are uh, very important to sign encrypt and forward messages, uh, but also to sign or verify um, verifiable credential, credentials and presentations. Okay, so overall, um, I know this was a lot of information to digest. However, uh, in total, there are 28 different components and considerations that make up uh, the reference model. And this uh, can be quite useful to have uh, an understanding of where the incompatibilities are when uh, we're trying to reach interoperability uh, with two different software stacks, for example. Okay, in that case, I will continue with the next part, the interoperability of SDI projects. So here, um, maybe again, uh, the information of what the problem uh, or the root cause of uh, our working group was or our uh, ambitions are is because the, uh, the showcase projects that are working on the four different projects have different backgrounds. And to give as an example of two different softwares, uh, uh, SSI stacks that are a part of is, one of them is the ID Union Tech stack, uh, which is based on Hyperledger Aries, Hyperledger Indie uh, based solution. Uh, which has a certain set of DIT methods that are used uh, at this point, DIT Sovereign or DIT Peer, uh, issues anonymous credentials and uses certain uh, interaction protocols such as issue credential uh, v1 protocol and present proof v1 protocol along with DITCOM v1. Uh, and in contrast, uh, there is the technology stack that is coming from YOLOCOM, which uses a certain set of DIT methods such as DIT YOLO and DIT ON. Uh, and also utilizes W3C standardized uh, verifiable credentials with JSON-LD um, credential format with J JSON web signatures. 
uh, it can also has it also has the various DIT and VC interaction protocols, which were uh, uh, custom made for credential issuance or credential share, uh, and the envelope was also custom made. So, uh, in order to uh, have a certain interoperability uh, or the organization level interoperability, as we uh, strive to do, we need to set or align in uh, these different. Uh, components, so to speak. And our all goal, overall goal, is to achieve organizational level interoperability within uh, the showcase projects while using the same standards and protocols, uh, which are recognized and used by international standardization organizations or, or organizations in general, such as the Central Identity Foundation, but also the Trust over IP or W3C. And therefore, to achieve at least up to semantic interoperability with SSI implementations across the globe, which uh, the last point uh, has to uh, yeah, point it out that they also need to follow these standards, of course, that are coming from these uh, organizations. And with that, I would like to get into our interoperability metrics where we identified per uh, layers that we mentioned uh, the points that we have to align on. And the first and foremost is coming from the trust layer. And the part that we have uh, identified is uh, the integration or implementation of the uh, DIT methods. Uh, first and uh, foremost being the DIT carry method that allows a GDPR compliant privacy preserving solution for uh, yeah, natural persons. It is analogous to, uh, analogous to peer, DIT peer, so the pairwise DIT. However, it comes with a couple of uh, caveats that are not, uh, really need to have such as uh, being able to do key rotation. Uh, it's an under development and, uh, carry, uh, and the underlying carry specification and one of the implementations or I, I think Yolocom is doing the implementation of uh, did carry uh, method. And the second one that is very important uh, for us is the did indie method, which has been specified. It's in the W3C did uh, registry at this point. And um, it is being in the implementation for the Indy ACK as well as um, in the VDR uh, to be used later on as an Indy method, uh, which is uh, going to unify all the different um, solutions that are using did Indy basically or uh, Hyperledger Indy. There's also maybe one more thing to mention here is the phases and iterations. Um, we do have multiple phases uh, and the first phase is uh, about achieving a minimum viable interoperability so to speak but overall this is an iterative process for us and in the second phase we are planning to also uh, yeah integrate uh, native the did epsi which is the did method for european blockchain services infrastructure also highly important uh, project across uh, uh, that has been uh, yeah, funded by the European Commission and uh, creates a uh, blockchain infrastructure for uh, certain use cases such as notarization or diplomas. On the second layer, agent layer, uh, we do have uh, aligned or we have an alignment over the envelope that we want to use. Uh, in the first phase, we are supporting uh, DITCOM v2. Um, which is being specified uh, by the Sanchez Identity Foundation, and uh, it is almost finalized, if I this is correct, from Drummond uh, one hour ago. Um, and in the second phase, we are thinking or planning to also implement uh, COP B2, which is the technology stack used by the OpenID Connect Foundation uh, to be able to um, send and receive encrypted uh, messages and verifiable credentials in that case. And for the uh, transport part, since uh, the envelope is a transport diagnostic, we have aligned in HTTP and uh, web sockets as starters because these are the ones that are most commonly used. And even though uh, theoretically it is possible to also use uh, yeah, uh, NFC or Bluetooth, we would like to start first a bit more plain and basic with HTTP and web sockets and maybe move on further if, uh, if there's any necessity for other transport methods. And maybe one more thing that is important uh, here for the alignment is the use of uh, out of band protocol according to the ARIES RFC uh, 434. This is a very important one to be able to exchange um, information uh, or did exchange before we have a secure communication channel that has been created with uh, using DISCOM. 
Then on the next part, we do have credential layer. And in credential layer, the alignment that we have uh, so far is the credential exchange, meaning we are going to be using issue credential v3 protocol and present proof v3 protocol coming from the Hyperledger Aries RSCs. Maybe a bit of a, a, a little background information regarding these uh, proof, uh, these protocols. Um, these protocols are uh, for interactions happening between either identity holder and verifier or identity holder with the issuer. Uh, and based on, uh, this is a state-based interaction and based on these states, certain type of messages can be uh, sent to uh, the different parties. And this has been standardized in uh, these protocols. Uh, V1 was more Hyperledger Indie uh, solutions uh, uh, meant for. Uh, in the V2, different type of proof types have been supported, such as the use of JSON LD, JSON Web Signatures, or uh, even BBS Plus. And in the V3, uh, DITCOM V2 is being implemented. So since we have DITCOM V2 in the envelope type, uh, we are aligning on the issue credential and present proof V3 protocols. And in the future iterations, we are planning to uh, include the OpenID Connect for verifiable presentations, which is a specification for sending verifiable credentials uh, presentations based on uh, the SIOP OpenID Connect SEC. And finally, we do have the cross-layer considerations, which is mostly uh, the uh, ARIES RFCs that are covered here, uh, acknowledgement or problem uh, reports, problem protocol we want, but also did exchange. These are kind of necessary to have uh, the use of uh, the protocols that we mentioned before, issue uh, credential and present proof, uh, but also the crypto primitive, which we align on is the ED25519 signatures, which are necessary for uh, creating the document uh as a verification I'll put it as a verification method but also uh for using it in a ditcom uh, v2 envelope and finally we do have the attachment formats to support the json ld credential attachment also in other areas rfc to support json ld and in the future bbs plus signatures and as a side note so uh, this also supports the presentation exchange attachment format and uh, credential manifest attachment format, which are the standardizations um, that are done by the Essentials Identity Foundation. And this can be uh, implemented in uh, while using issue credential or present proof protocols. So this is not everything that we are uh, uh, have. I mean, our job, uh, work is not done. We do have a couple of roadblocks. Uh, we do have parts that we have not aligned on so far. Uh, one of them being the proof types and the other one being the uh, revo uh, revocation. And the proof types, uh, there are two different, yeah. Uh, ones that, the first one that we want to align on is the BBS plus signatures because this is where the uh, SSI community is uh, evolving into. Uh, however, at this current stage, uh, one of the consortia, the ID union is using um, Aries interoperability profile uh, V1 and uh, utilizing also anon creds uh, with it. And due to some regularity, uh, regulatory uncertainties that are so far in uh, European Union uh, regarding uh, trust frameworks such as IDAS, uh, Electronic Identification Trust Framework for EU and the toolbox that is gonna come with it within the next six months, uh, one consortia wants to stay in the anon creds uh, until we have a regulatory uh, clearing, so to speak. And the second part that is also not aligned completely is the revocation part. Uh, there are highly uh, uh, privacy preserving, but not so very scalable private, uh, uh, revocation solutions such as we see in the anon creds that is uh, very privacy preserving, but cannot scale to the levels of 100 millions. And also uh, on the other end of the spectrum, there are um, highly scalable solutions with bit arrays and bit strings, but not privacy preserving solutions that can scale up to billions without uh, uh, getting into seeing even megabytes. Uh, however, uh, they are not privacy preserving. And to solve this revocation problem, there are still ongoing parts, both uh, all consortia have uh, participants in the DIFF Decentralized Identity working, uh, Foundation Working Group for Crypto Working Group. And this is also an ongoing process. So maybe uh i can give a bit of our key learnings from our um, 
yeah, dermatologists as a little side note, maybe our background is diverse in SSI six and coming together to have interoperability on an organizational level. And based on that uh, background, we have learned that we need to check certain things such as uh, setting up interoperability goals, uh, looking at with whom we want to be interoperable, what, what level we want to be interoperable and for which use cases we want to be interoperable. And from that point on identified incompatibilities, uh, we use the reference model, which we found very uh, helpful uh, to understand these incompatibilities and then align on the set of standards and protocols where we can align and where there is no alignment, such as we saw in the roadblocks for the proof types and uh, revocation, uh, revocations, start with the aligned standards and protocols. And uh, yes, our future work uh, seems such as uh, with the continuation of finding solutions for these roadblocks for credential proof on revocation while implementing, uh, working on the implementation on components that we have aligned on such as DIT methods, uh, DITCOM v2 envelope, uh, and also the use of ARIES issue credential and pro present proof protocol v3s. And last but not least, um, yeah, we will also check at the testing, uh, how, how we can test interoperability. And for that, since we have a lot of ARIES RFCs that are happening, uh, we're planning to use uh, ARIES test harness for that and uh, fork it to fit into the needs of SDI projects. And in concluding words, maybe interoperability as uh, of SSI implementations are still a significant problem. Uh, different historical business decisions such as privacy preserving feature or uh, high scalability or uh, use of semantic disambiguity has created different implementations. And this divergence in the credential layer is still the most significant problem with respect to SSI interoperability. However, there is work going on there and interoperability with standards and protocols are still possible in the future by using, for example, the presentation exchange for exchanging credentials. And with that, I would like to finish uh, our presentation today with a thank you 